What is going on to all my Halloween fans out there and welcome back to my channel. We are here today to discuss all things Halloween ends. This is a spoiler discussion, scene breakdown, what worked, what didn't work. We're going to talk about the ending. We're just going to have a conversation about this film and this franchise. We're going to just have a conversation, y'all. This is going to be a fun video. Very excited to be here with you all. Before we get into all the details, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting that notification bell. That way you can stay up to date with all my daily content. You can also give your boy a follow on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. All those links can be found in the description of this video. If you enjoyed this video, do your boy a favor. Hit that thumbs up. Share this video. It means a lot to me, and I appreciate the support. Light up the comments. Let's talk all things Halloween ends. Again, this is a full spoiler discussion, so let's talk about what really worked, what didn't work, what you think about the ending, the Corey plot, the Allison, the, all of it. Let's talk about it all in the comments below. If you all haven't seen the film yet, again, you've been warned. I do have a spoiler-free review that's currently on the channel that gives you more of a detailed uh, breakdown of my thoughts on the film, my score on the film, and where I rank this amongst the other films in this particular set of films with 2018 and kills and obviously 1978 so you can check out that video but we're here talking spoilers and let's just jump right into it man first impression so let me just lay some ground rules and i'm gonna have time codes in the description so you can kind of follow along where you want to click on a topic or what have you but I'm a fan of this franchise, man. 1978 Halloween is my favorite film of all time in regards to the horror genre. And reasons being, it's a simple story, y'all. John Carpenter's direction was solid. The score is perfect. Love Laurie's character. The, the kills were brutal. The story is, again, it's simplicity. And this film, Halloween Ends, lacks simplicity. It's so convoluted. It's so all over the place. It lacks focus. It lacks care. This wasn't a good film. And again, you can see my full review to get all those thoughts. But I am a fan of this franchise. And I am very aware of how this franchise has some very... Half of the films are bad. <laughs> We're being honest with each other, in my personal opinion. You know, I love, again, 78. I'm a fan of the sequel. I actually have fun with the anthology, uh, you know, Season of the Witch. I like 4. I like H2O, some elements. And, you know, again, there's a lot of schmuck. There's a lot of craziness. There's the Thorn Cult. There's the Rob Zombie film. So, listen, I'm, I'm very aware that the track record isn't that clean. And, and I'm going to say it now. Halloween Ends isn't the worst of the franchise. And I'm referring to all the films with 13, 14 of them. But it's in the conversation. It's in that top tier or say bottom tier as far as quality goes. And the first thing I want to start off by saying is to me, this didn't feel like a Halloween film. This more felt like to me Halloween three situation where it was kind of almost, I don't want to say anthology because Michael's in it. And the lore is in it, and Lori's in it, and all this stuff, and the continuity from the previous films is in it, but it just lacked the care that I want from this franchise, and particularly knowing that David Gordon Green brought us what I consider a really good film in 2018 Halloween. From there on, it got worse. Kills, I actually like the first half. I like how they set up the the back, the back, flashbacks and all the different stuff there. But obviously, once we get to that portion at the hospital and Lori's sign line and evil does and all that stuff is trash. This film, Kills to me, Halloween ends, ends, just started off. It started off interesting. First off, like I mentioned, how this felt like a riff of Halloween 3, the season of the witch, the title sequence from right off the bat. That, that's literally the same font and the same colors of that film. And I should have known then that that was probably an uh, idea of what we're going to get into with this film because it pretty much is a Michael Myerless movie and he's literally absent from the film. <sighs> probably 90% of the film he's not in the movie, which is just absurd. You know, he's in it 40 minutes into it and then he doesn't come back out. He's missing for like 15 minutes after that and then you get him at the end. What a mess. Let's talk about it. So we open on Halloween night. Uh, it's a year after the events of 2018's Halloween. So it's picking up a year after Halloween kills. We're introduced to the situation. You have Corey Cunningham, who is, seems to be normal, seems to have his head straight. And we later meet his, you know, his living situation a little bit later. But he's going off to college. I assume he wants to go to be, a, I don't know, a mechanic. Or he's going to babysit the kid. The parents are going off. And right off the bat, first off, let's just address the elephant in the room. That kid was an a-hole, man. That kid was a straight-up asshole. <laughs> he's calling Corey ugly and this, that, and the third. 
he's watching, they're watching, shout out to John Carpenter, and they're watching a thing, which is a fantastic film. Go to bed. You gotta go to bed. He's like, you're a terrible babysitter, blah, blah, blah. Corey goes into the kitchen, which, by the way, what was his obsession with milk? I don't know. Is there an undertone of why he loved milk? I don't know. Maybe because he's a baby. Uh, <laughs> the man goes in the kitchen. He gets his milk. He takes a slice of cake, and he, the, the lamp falls, and someone's screaming. And as an audience member, you're like, wait a minute. Michael's here? Why, why is Michael here a year later after what happened to him in 2018's, you know, Halloween Kills and all the, you know, stuff that happened to him? Like, why would he just on this, you know, it's obviously Halloween, but why this house? Why these characters? Lo and behold, it's not Michael. The little douchebag is praying a, a plank on Corey. And at this point, the parents are, are home. Very kind of like a scream film, right? The first scream with Drew Barrymore. What's your favorite scary movie? And she's on the phone and the parents are slowly coming up. But the parents finally get there. But at this point, Corey's locked in the attic. He's upset. And the little kid's like, ah, yeah, I got you. Michael's going to get you. The boogeyman's going to get you. Corey's freaking out. Again, he's a baby, right? Drinking all this milk. He eventually kicks the door open, and the little kid is standing right next to the door. He hits the kid in the face, and the kid falls down the what, three flight of stairs, lands on his face, which I'm not going to lie. There's not a lot of movies that show kids dying, right? There's like a lot of restrictions around that. That kid clearly died, right? He, we know that. He falls on his face, man, and they didn't <laughs> listen. That was pretty brutal. They didn't pan away. They showed that kid hitting his face on the ground and dying in a, in a pool of blood. And this is where I'm like, what is this? <laughs> David Gordon, he has the camera. Like He did this a lot to the film. It's like a zoom in, zoom out. We see the perspective of the mom. She looks up and like, ah, and he's just looking down. It had some, a, a tinge of the original Halloween in regards to like that innocence of Corey was like gone at that moment, right? Obviously he's going to meet Michael later in the film that really kind of consumes him with the evil, but that look on Corey's face, he's like, I didn't do it. I didn't mean to do it. Obviously Michael did what he did in 1978's Halloween. He was evil, right? Opening was interesting. Again, no Michael, which is the theme of this film, but it was an interesting way, a cold open to this very cold film. Let me know what you all thought of the open and were you surprised by the, the handling of that kid and how brutal it was when he died. So as we pivot over from here, theming aspect of this film, I mentioned it in my non-spoiler review, Ori was the best part of the film. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. She brought some funk. She brought some flair. She brought some personality to the character. Like very early on, Lori was smiling, joking around, talking about showing your tits to the, <laughs> all that stuff was, it was kind of over the top, but I love Lori. She's my favorite final girl. So I was taking all that stuff in. And once we kind of meet Lori at this point in the film, she is giving us the voiceover. Like, honestly, you don't even have to see Halloween 8, 2018 or Kills because she pretty much gives you a montage or a voiceover of all the events that from 1978, how all that shaped out, pivoting over to 40 years later in 2018, obviously showing us the events there in Halloween Kills. And there we find out she's writing a memoir, Write Your Own Story, which is, is again, can't stress enough, the Lori stuff was the best stuff because it made sense to the continuity that was established in 2018, Halloween Kills, and a cohesive story there. That was the only element I'll give David some credit with and also giving credit to Lori and, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis. She's like, listen, I've already returned to this franchise a few times and, and the way they handled my character was terrible. I'm going to have some more say this time around. And you can definitely see that within this film in particular because in Kills, she was, like I said, she was sidelined. She was in a hospital the whole damn film. And boy, the role switch in this movie, because Michael was taking that same L in this movie, just taking a nap throughout the entire film. We'll get to that. So she's writing her book, and she's letting Michael go and all that stuff, and she's now living with Allison, and she's cut her hair. Again, she's looking to just be a new person, to, to let the past be the past and move on with her life, which I like that element. And again, I like the characteristics there. We have Lindsay, who, let's just say this now, Lindsay was in, what, two scenes? This scene, and she's later on seen in the bar, and I think she was in the scene when they're doing them, they put Michael on the car, which we'll get to that point, but Lindsay was wasted. I don't even know why they kept her alive. They should have just killed her in Halloween Kills, but neither here nor there. Lindsay's visiting. She's reading the tarot cards to Allison, and the death card pops up, and, I, and when she mentioned, oh, that's not a bad thing. That just is a, it can be interpreted as a new beginning. AKA Corey, which we'll talk about their relationship here. But Michael still has a hold on the town. And again, man, first 15, 20 minutes or so was solid. It was a solid movie. The Corey stuff at the beginning, 
But Lori's stuff, at, you know, how where were you at in this timeline, how things have shaped up. And then the town, the, the hold, the fear, the trauma that Michael has put on this town is still very prominent within the community. We're seeing people taking their own lives, shooting themselves, hanging themselves. I mean, it was pretty dark. I'm like, man, this is shaping up, <laughs> all pun intended, to be something very interesting. I remember David saying in an interview, mentioned how the pandemic, first off, we learned it was going to be four years after Halloween Kills, which I'm like, whoa, that's very interesting. And he mentioned that the film is going to reflect today's society and particularly the pandemic. I guess his reasoning to putting that in the script, and I guess let me know if you all felt the same way, but You'll notice that they mention disease within this film, right? That Michael's a disease. The evil's a disease. It's consuming these people. I don't know if that was their social commentary referring to the pandemic and in particularly how that disease spread and also fear spread and misinformation spread a la the Willie the Kid, the DJ in this film, was spreading misinformation. He was leaking things. He was creating fear. So I think that was what David was referring to, how the pandemic kind of shaped the script and had an influence on this film. Let me know how you all feel about that. But at this point, we see the town is looking for their next boogeyman, and they found it in the form of Corey Cunningham. I can't remember if they said if he went to court. You know, We don't know if it was a mistrial, if it was enough information, how he was able to get out. But nonetheless, he's out, right? But brings us to these douchebag teenagers who I'm going to say it right now, y'all. Those kids deserved it. <laughs> when it comes to that junkyard scene, I'm obviously joking. I don't condone violence. But in, in the conversation of this film, that scene was awesome. But neither here nor there. The teenagers are picking on him by that he killed the kid. And again, he's drinking milk. And this is when Lori and him come into contact. And again, Lori having her fun, kind of funny moments. One of the few funny moments to me in this movie when she's like, who's going to do it? And she takes out her knife and they slash the tires of the one kid. Take him to the hospital because he cut his hand on the milk. And this is when she inadvertently introduces Allison to Corey, not knowing, knew, she knew who Corey was at that point in the film. She she later got confirmation with the whole dad conversation, the bar later, but she knew who Corey was. Obviously, it's a small town. Everyone knows who, knows who he is. And they talked about which one are you? Are you the freak or the, the victim? I can't remember what the, the freak show or the monster. I can't remember the phrase that they use, but she introduced them. Now, I will say I found it odd that Lori, not, put, not judging a book by his cover and knowing how people consider her to be a monster and we'll talk about that was so stupid when the town was blaming her I thought that was kind of silly but I I'm I'm taught on torn because I can see how she wants to give Corey a chance because she's going through that Allison's going through that so on and so forth so I see that angle but at the same time I wouldn't think that she would want to bring that baggage onto Allison this dude who is known for killing a kid. Obviously, he wasn't found guilty, but I wouldn't think that she would want to only introduce these two. I don't know. It seems like that's a lot of baggage to put on Allison, especially considering what she's been through. But speaking of Allison, we talk about how this film dealt with her being thirsty as hell from that cop who, listen, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but you telling me this young, beautiful, I think the actress that played Allison is very attractive, would fall into a, a, a relationship with, I can't remember the cop's name, who looked to be at least in his mid-40s. I'm like, come on, this is a bit of a stretch. I, I can't believe this, right? Uh, she was very thirsty, man. She was like all over Corey, and I get the whole, she saw his trauma, she saw his pain. They they matched each other's energy, but I'm like, come on, Allison, you could do much better than that, but neither here nor there. I thought Allison, her character was very one note. She was just seeped in trauma she was just jumped in this relationship she was head over heels for Corey and I thought that to be very just very bad writing and I, and I mentioned in my spoiler free review I like Allison I like the actress I thought she had a really good interesting arc and I'm gonna say it now they should have eliminated the Corey character because he completely came out of left field he should have been in the beginning if they want to do this this thing that they do with him with the copycat killer angle which should have literally just went with the route with Allison became the new killer she has faced Michael in the first one, 2018. She's heavily involved in the second one, but she was the one going on the manhunt. She should have been, and they, they kind of went the angle. She's going all goth. She's wearing black all the time, the black hair, the black dress. She should have been the killer. I, I would assume people would have been like, oh, this is an agenda. This is woke, blah, 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 blah. But it would have made more sense to the story than having Corey, who comes out of nowhere. And I've seen all the films. Let me know in the comments if I missed something. I don't believe Corey had his family, the Cunningham family. I don't think they had any continuity in any of the other films. Correct me if I'm wrong. But, like, the Corey angle was just so stupid. You're telling me you got 
Lori, Michael, Allison, and now you're just bringing in this third random guy to be the lead of the movie? Boo. And it's at this point where the townspeople, as I mentioned, is blaming Lori for egging on Michael. And we even get the black lady, the Halloween kills. She survived, which, okay, I guess she got stabbed in the neck with a, a fluorescent light and bled out, I thought. But she's alive and her sister's like, you did this. You edged on Michael and everyone hates Lori. Again, they're trying to find someone to blame, and it's Corey, and it's Lori. Again, that's where their stories collide, and that's how they can kind of relate to each other. But either way, Haddonfield people, you're trash. As we move on, Allison invites him to the party. My goodness, this party was so weird. It was just very weird. He's on the floor dancing. They're taking the photo booth, and then the mom's at the bar. Oh, you can't have fun. You don't deserve to have fun. And take off your mask and show them who you are. He runs out. At this point, I'm like, this is a CW, Lifetime, Freeform movie, Hallmark. He runs out in the street. Allison chases him. Why did you let her do that? Where were you? Why didn't you keep me safe? Why did This is why I stay home. And she's like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I was on the other side. It's like, what the f Why? What? Why are you blaming her, bruh? Anyway, you're a grown-ass man. You, you you didn't want to go to the party? Don't go to the party, man. But I thought that scene was just ridiculous. It was just so melodramatic and just so over the top. But speaking of over the top, we get back to those teenage kids who are, again, chasing him throughout the movie. And they get theirs a little bit later. They throw him over the, the bridge. And they're like, I didn't push him. He fell. This is the moment. He We see him get dragged. It's Michael that drags him into the sewer, right? And apparently the homeless man said that he does this frequently. He, he drags people in and they don't come out and all that stuff. But he drags him in. Corey later wakes up and he gets, we see it in the trailer. He's choked by Michael and Michael just stares at him. He's obviously still shell of himself, but he's choking him and they make eye contact. And we see it and they... We can assume his full bled, the disease, right? The consuming of, of evil, the shape changing, evil changing shapes, it consumes him. Now, obviously, he's already battered and bruised. His ego's missing. His, he's kind of lost. He's, he's, he's afraid. He's fearful. His life sucks. It's easy to consume someone that's already almost defeated. So he essentially passes on his evil to Corey. He goes out and makes his first kill. He kills accidentally but also stabs the homeless man but by all means he was protecting himself because the homeless man pulled a knife on him was like get back in there michael's gonna finish you so it's kind of self-defense neither way that's his first kill now he's revisiting he's going back and apologizing to allison which Lori should have shut that shit down right then the man's battered and bruised and i don't know why Lori thought that she would have been a little bit more on her 2018 like no nah, I'm, I'm shutting this down like no nah, kid go on somewhere you're trouble but you know Juliet love story begins because now they're really into each other like I said just to remind you this is 40 minutes into the movie that we finally get Michael Myers it's the 40 minute mark of this film come on now at this point in the film they are this is where Corey comes up to Allison and says you want to burn it down? Let's burn it together. Again, this Romeo and Juliet angle, which I'm like, dude, this is this bad writing. Corey, he manages to get the cop to follow him into the sewers, which again, this is where Michael Meyer cameos into the film. Michael is beaten. He's broken. He's beaten, man. He, he's not himself. He's a shell of himself, but he gets his knife and he's stabbing the guy. And he's doing like his Tyrone Bigham's cocaine adrenaline move where he's like getting back to his form because when he kills people, he kind of gets more into that evil, that shape, that boogeyman type of uh, mindset. And Corey's like, you know, teach me how to do it. And he kills the guy, right? So now Corey's like feeling, they're both like getting this energy from each other to kind of move on, right? So uh, let me know how, what you all thought of that scene. I thought it was ridiculous. And again, Michael kind of, you know, getting that adrenaline rush and getting back to himself, which was, again, it was so odd because I could have sworn the homeless man said that Michael has been doing this. He occasionally takes people and kills them. I assume it was other homeless people. And you would think if he kept doing that, that he would like eventually get back to himself. But as the film contradicts itself, he's just a man in a mask, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But as we move on, now Lori sees that something's off with Corey and she gets that confirmation with the father of the kid that died earlier in the film when he said he tried to talk to Corey, tried to forgive him, but he looked in his eyes and he saw that it wasn't Corey. He said that Corey didn't kill my son, but something else did. He's something else now. So now Lori knows what's up. He gets his second kill by the doctor 
and Deb, I think was the girl's name, when kills the doctor, which was completely bait and switch in a trailer. Like they showed the shot in the trailer, the doctor in the pool, but that wasn't the scene. He has his mask on from the party, which was the uh, scarecrow mask, and he suffocates the doctor and stab him in the face with a corkscrew, which is pretty brutal. And then Michael kills the woman in the bathroom, and he does the iconic kill where he kills the guy in 1978 and he stabs him and hangs him on a wall that was kind of an homage there while all that's happening Allison is getting ready to leave town and she's waiting for him meanwhile right from wrong Corey goes back to Michael and he wants to do more killings after he gets his brutal kill with the doctor and this was so disrespectful he goes into the sewer wrestles with Michael. They have a little bit of a scuffle. He tells him, you don't deserve the mask because you're just a man in the mask, I think was the line that he said there, which was just humanizes Michael. It makes him just a man. It, it takes all the way the fear and it contradicts Halloween Kills because in Halloween Kills, if I'm not mistaken, they said that he's more than just a man. So this... The film was all over the place at this point, right? Kills his mom, who his mom was like in another different movie. She was so over the top. I hated that character. She gets her death, and it was off screen, by the way, which was so stupid, which leads us into the highlights of the film, the best kills of this movie, which we see Corey eggs on those teenagers that he's been battling with the whole film by like drawing or marking on their car. Takes him to the, the junkyard. First kills the one kid. He stabs him in the eye. They're freaking out. The main kid is screaming, trying to get the attention of the one good guy to Corey, which is his, it wasn't a stepdad, but the guy who was dating his mom and gave him a job. He tries to get his attention and he gets the gun. While Corey has managed to get into the car, he runs over the girl. She's still alive at this point. He runs her over and pins her in the fence. He kills the black girl by hitting her over the head with a wrench. And then he, the kid shoots his friend, which I feel bad for him. He's a nice guy. He shoots him in the head. Corey sneaks away, then Corey takes a blowtorch and melt, that was pretty brutal, man, he melts that kid's face, that was, and they, they didn't really show up, they, sh they showed it, it was kind of blurred out or whatever, but it was effective, you knew what he was doing, kills him, then he kills the girl who was under the truck by smashing her face, and again, that, listen, the film is trash, but that kill, and then his next kill was pretty awesome, next kill is Willie the Kid, the DJ who was making fun of him a little bit early in the film, he embarrassed him in front of Allison, he goes into the DJ station. He kills the woman at the front desk, which I can't remember that lady's name. I know she's like well known in the horror community. Let me know who that woman was. I, I know her face is very recognizable. I can't remember her name right now. But he kills her. Then he kills Willie by bashing that man's head in numerous times and his jaws broke and teeth and tongues all out. Which, speaking of his tongue all out, Corey cuts his tongue, throws his head back on the booth, and his tongue is spinning on the DJ reel. That was fire, bro. That was like the only thing. I'm like, that's pretty creative. That's a pretty top tier kill for me, if you ask me. Let me know what you all thought about that. Those those kills back to back. I thought they were pretty awesome, in my personal opinion. But now we move on, and Lori already kind of knows what's up. She can sense someone's in the house. She called 911, which was very smart on her. She tells him, "I'm gonna, there's, a, you know, I'm gonna take my life," which was smart because if she would have said, "There's an intruder," there's Michael's back, they wouldn't have believed her. It's Lori Strode. She's probably wilding out again. She's going back to her old ways, but she says, "No, I'm gonna take my life." I like how she did that because now Corey, being the rookie, amateur, terrible killer of himself copycat killer he falls for it and she's she shoots the gun but she shoots the pumpkin but then she shoots him twice i believe and i correct me if i'm wrong when he falls over the balcony i think they wanted to make us go back to the beginning of the movie how that kid fell i think it was kind of a similar shot for shot how he fell over the balcony whatever the case may be but at this point allison's driving up to the house and again i think this whole kind of plays out to the opening of the movie she comes in but before she comes in Corey looks at Lorian says, if I can't have her, no one will, which, like I mentioned, reminded me of fear. He stabs himself in the neck, killing himself, and Lori, dumbass. <laughs> I love Lori, no disrespect, but she picks up the knife, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Like, what are you doing, Lori? Like, you knew she was outside, and you played right into his hand. That was so stupid. She takes the knife. Allison is obviously like, how, what did you, how did you do, why did you, do? stupid. Allison, you didn't been through the shit with your grandmother. From 2018, the kills, like, give her the goddamn benefit of the doubt. I don't care if what Corey told you these lies. Like, this is your, you've been through a lot more with your grandmother than you have in the last, what, 48, 72 hours you spent with him? It was ridiculous. Allison, you're trash. She does that, and Lori is at this point, she's upset with herself, obviously, but then she hears something. It's Michael. 
he finally comes in, he gets his mask, he, he, he has, Michael has two kills in this movie, the one with the cop in the, his sewer crib, and then now he kills Corey, he snaps his neck, because Corey, by the way, he's still alive, he's like, no, and then he cracks his neck, so two kills for Michael in this film, I think that's a, a record low for any Halloween film, again, Michael Myers, the cameo, so now the standoff happens, which, it felt a bit short to me, it was like five minutes, but it was, it was, at this point in the film, mind you, I'm already checked out, I'm like, I'm empty inside, I like this film, I'm just like, I'm just watching it now, I didn't care, but the final standoff was, was, was entertaining, I'll give it that, we, the, the scene pretty much plays out, he comes into the kitchen, he's manhandling her, he's overpowering her, which even if he is wounded, that should be the case, no offense to Lori, but yes, this man is 6'3", 6'5", 2", 20, he would overpower her, no, no disrespect to Lori, but yes, that was very true what happened in that scene, he's throwing her around, almost takes off her hand, kind of revenge for cutting off his fingers, and, and I don't know if, if he, if she did cut one of her fingers, because her hand looked to be bloody, but neither here, they manage to, she manages to over, not overpower him, but she maneuvers a way where she stabs his hand onto the table, she manages to push him down again and get the other hand, pushes the fridge on him, and now she's talking her shit, right? This is the stereotypical movie where the film's character has to say their moment of speech. The speech works, but it's just like, come on, man, just get it over with. But she tells him, I'm no longer afraid of you. I'm no longer running from you. And at this point, she takes off his mask and it's like, you're just a man in a mask. You're just a human. She has the, the knife and she does the whole, what was that, Halloween H2O with the poster where you can see my, the faces of the characters in the knife, so she looks at, it was kind of corny, but it was, it was kind of cool, I guess, how they was able to manage to get that shot, but she shows his face in the knife, and she stabs him in the neck, in comes, and by the way, before Allison comes in, he eventually, like, cuts his whole hand through, and choking her, and she, at this point, is just like, this kill me, get it over with, let's just die together, Allison at this point is in the house. She manages to break Michael's arm, and at this point, he's already bleeding out from the the knife in his throat. She takes a knife, slits his like an artery in his wrist, and she's bleeding him out. And now, Officer, uh, the the love interest for Lori, comes to the house. Lori, are you okay? No, we got we got one more thing to do, which I thought was kind of cheesy, uh, but this to get the fear out of this town. They tie Michael on the roof, and they go on this this. <laughs> This Michael is dead to her down the streets of Haddonfield, and everyone's following him. It's like a memorial service. Everyone's following and getting the fear out of the city and in the town. They make it back to the famous junkyard. And hey, I actually like this because it's like, how do you get rid of evil? Well, you, you throw it in the trash, which this film was. <laughs> they put him in this thing, and they literally smash him to pieces, man. It crushes him. He's dead. He, he's dead. He is dead. We end the film with Lori letting go, Allison leaving town, which she should have did at the beginning of this film, and we, we pivot into, she's having a relationship with the cop, right, he drops off the vegetables or the red, whatever, blossom comment, she's in the house, we hear her voiceover, we go through the kitchen, we go into all the house, we go into her room, she has the mask, now the question is, is it a trophy? Is it a memorabilia to remember the past and she defeated the past? Or is it Lori looked into the eyes of evil and shape and evil takes different shapes? Is Lori going to be the next shape moving forward? I hope to God that is not what they were alluding to. Let me know your thoughts on that ending and how all things wrapped up. But overall, listen, David Gordon Green... The story was bad, man. I mentioned in my review, this is not a Michael Myers film. This is just his version of Halloween 3, uh, Season of the Witch, because it was not a lot of Michael. It was almost an anthology. It was almost an Elseworld type of story with characters and stories from the previous films, which I found to be very ridiculous. The Corey stuff, man, that copycat killer angle was really bad for me. The love between Allison and Corey, Romeo and Juliet meets fear was really bad. Only saving grace, Lori, some solid kills, and the standoff was fine. But overall, this film was not fine. The characters were lazy. Here for any of them. I didn't like this movie, man. I did not like this movie at all, but hey, 30-something minutes later, I'm going to try to trim it down a little bit more, but this was just a venting session 
As far as rankings go, 1978, as far as the rankings within this, this trilogy or four films now, 1978, 2018 Halloween, Halloween Kills, and then all the way at the bottom is Halloween Ends for me. Share your list in the comments. Let me know your thoughts on this film, favorite moments, Easter eggs, deeper meanings, um, things you like, things you didn't like. Let's have the discussion in the comments. If you stuck around to this 30 plus minute point of the review, thank you so much. Put in the comments right now, like I did in my other video, put hashtag no more Halloween movies. Put it in the comments. You all are awesome. Before you leave, just a friendly reminder to like, share, comment, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out my content that's on the channel right now. Hit that button. Come and join the family. Check out my other reviews this year. Check out my most recent breakdown, and we'll see you all on the next video.